Hi, I'm Kurt Dodo with Realm IQ. This is our podcast, Realm IQ Sessions, where we talk about everything AI with AI leaders from around the world. And, you know, please give us a follow or subscribe. Today's guest is Russell Schwartz, currently the associate professor at Chapman University, Dodge College of Film and New Media, but he has a rich history in movie marketing with companies like Gramercy Pictures, New Line Cinema, and he has worked with some of the biggest filmmakers of all time. Russell, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to have you as a guest. We go way back. Our kids were raised together and your family friend, but you know, certainly appreciate your professional expertise and your career. So did I get your bio right? Do you want to add anything to it? Because no, that's, that's, that's fine. I mean, I guess I've started really in the mid eighties, which dates me a bit, but I don't care. Sort of at the really, very beginning of the American independent cinema movement. There was a couple of, ind you know, smaller companies that existed at that point myself. I had a company called Island Pictures, which was run by Island Records owner named Chris Blackwell, who, you know, was a legend in his own world. And then that migrated into what I, I, a short term at, at Miramax pre all their nonsense, but you know, there's some amazing movies work, working that. And then in early 91, 92, I joined a company or started a company called Gramercy Pictures, which was a joint venture with Universal and Polygram, which is a British production company owned by the music company, Philips, well, Polygram Records owned by Philips. And the, that idea was to use four or five independent production companies, sort of feeding into a centralized distribution mechanism which was my company at that point. And, you know, we had, an, we had an amazing number of companies. We had Working Toddle, who was, I don't know what these, these names mean very much to you, but Working Toddle, which has done, you know, an enormous amount of British movies over the years. We had a deal with Jodie Foster's company, A Pictures. We had a deal with the original Propaganda, which then became Anonymous, which is, you know, another great prolific producer. Ted Field from Interscope Records. So anyway, it was all about these individual companies feeding into it, essential. So it was sort of a, it was a horizontal feed rather than a typical corporate vertical feed. So the, the, the kinds of movies that came out of that, out of those companies were all very, very distinct and unique to each other. So we weren't following a, you know, a prescribed thought process of how to make independent movies. They were just free to go. And you know, there's a very, very, really, really successful movie. I mean, probably, well, they also, Working Title also produced the Coen Brothers movies at that point. So. I got involved with Fargo and the Big Lebowski. They have another movie called Four Weddings and the Funeral. And it just went on and on and on with thing. But it was a great time. But like all, at one point, these companies tend to, actually, Polygram tried to become bigger and compete with the studios. And that was where their big mistake was. So they ramped up another company on top of mine to, to compete, which, of course, the movies they came up with were just didn't quite work. So, you know, within a short term, that was the end of that. And... Pieces of my company that merged into what became USA Films, run by owned by Barry Diller, and then that was a few years. Again, another great run of movies, probably most known for Traffic, the Soderbergh film. And then I was asked to join New Line as head of marketing in early 2001, which was a very interesting time because it was about, you know, seven, six months before 9-11. Uh, so there was a lot to deal with. And then we had a small little art movie called Lord of the Rings, which we had tried to small little all the crowds for you. Which we had to try to figure out who's going to go see this movie, given it, it might sound like it was success at the, right now, but certainly back then, the only people who were aware of it were, you know, 50 year olds, a bunch of nerds, you know, or Peter Jackson, Lip oh, nice. yeah, yeah it's, no. for sure. And then every high school, every high school person like myself who bought the books and never read them just so we could sort of say we had them. Anyway, that, that was, that's another story and another podcast perhaps, but it was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, what a great history and, uh, you know, independent filmmaking as we enter this era of how is AI impacting filmmaking? I actually think there's a pendulum that swings and it will swing back towards independent filmmaking because these filmmakers are scrappy. They work with no money, but they tell great 
human stories that are authentic. And, you know, there's a criticism from whatever's happening with AI and cell embed. You know, where are we going? Is it synthetic? Where's the soul? Where's the creator? Uh, who's writing the stories? And, you know, I, so I, I think there will be a, an audience desire for independent films again. And uh, I, I think there's a opportunity and a resurgence of that amidst all this technology disruption, all the studio disruption. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of hope for filmmakers. I don't think it's a pessimistic future. What do you think about the future of filmmaking and AI? I think AI has surely leveled the playing field in terms of being able to do the physical, the, the physical means of making a movie. I think that's all great. I don't think AI will ever be able to write an original screenplay that an audience would necessarily respond to. Because again, you know, as William Golding, Goldman said many, many years ago, nobody knows anything about this business. And it still seems to ring true. You know, the studios have certainly gone for a very tried and true formula, but the independents, they are definitely thriving. I think the problem that the independents have right now is the theatrical experience has certainly dimmed, mostly because of the pandemic and the contraction of a lot of movie theaters. Yeah. And at the same time, the what was a rush of content that was welcomed by all these new streamers, it has also started to flatline a little bit. So it's going to be a tricky time for the next few few years. I think AI will very successfully integrate itself into the process and into the system. But then the question then becomes, well, where's what are the outlets? You know, where can these movies be shown? You know, if there was a an aggregating uh, streamer that took every wonderful art movie or specialized film that was done in the past, you know, every year and was able to put them on a streaming service and, and interact with a, a, an exhibition chain. So it was a seamless integration from a, even a limited run in theaters and then moving right into a platform. I think that's a very successful formula for independent film, if, you know, but again, right now it, it, it's scattered. It's all over the place. You have Hulu, you have this one, that one. They're all playing, you know, versions of these movies and picking up, it's sort of really cherry picking, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, there aren't too many young filmmakers who are really being consistent outside of people like Sean Baker, you know, who has an Nora coming out right now and the Florida Project, very, very low budget films, extraordinarily original. Yeah. We need more of him at the, at the same, or her, whatever, whoever it will be. Greta Gerwig, certainly. But the... You know, to survive in the independent world is, 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 is very difficult now. You know, it's very difficult. And raising money is even more so. So again, the AI tools that are around certainly help, you know, the production process, which is great. And I think everybody should embrace those. I mean, with people lose their jobs, you know, animators lose their job because it could all be, you know, pre-configured. Uh, will a screenwriter lose their job because they can, you know, someone can use it, you know, AI or, or some screenwriting program to write. I don't, I don't really necessarily think so. I used Chad GTP just yesterday to write a poem. I'd written a poem forever. And, you know, it was very treatly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm spending the next five days, you know, trying to re rewrite it. But that's sort of what it is. It got, it got me going. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, you're at the center of that, right? You had an idea, you, you went to this AI platform and you're trying to get results and work with it. I think these, you know, screenwriters, editors, they have to realize that they're still at the center of what they could create. And if they look at it as a tool and not a, not a replacement, because robots aren't going to write these things. It's going to be a human using these tools, just, just like. You know, we've moved from a typewriter to a word processor to a computer. I mean, those are all things. And then the internet, uh, these are all things that have helped uh, people write, right? Research, yeah. organized thoughts. And so now with ChatGPT or GPT search, you know, don't go out to Google anymore. They're, they're finding more meaningful results with these new AI platforms. So. Let's just talk about education for a little while, because you are leading the next generation of young creative producers, filmmakers, film marketers. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who's leading who, but okay. Well, I mean, you're in a position, right? And you had in your locale, your finger on the pulse of what the students are thinking and how are they embracing AI? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I teach in the marketing world. I'm not, I'm not in the production world right now. So all my students are creative producers and they are, you know, a lot of the projects which I give them are, you know, there's no wrong or right answer. This is not like a math, a math class that I teach where this is yes and this is no. I just try to get them, get engage them to think creatively about marketing campaigns, about, about kind of the kind of content they want to go ahead and, and produce when they graduate. And we certainly put them on paths towards that. And yes, they all use it. Like I, I've said to them, look, I don't, I'm happy for you to use AI in any way you want in terms of putting together a marketing deck, but just put it in your own voice. Because one thing I, I have seen is there's a lot of cut and pasting and it just, I just said, guys, no, that's not going to, that's not the way it works. Right. You know, I'm fine with you using it as a template, but get original about it because again, you know, when you ask someone to break down a social media campaign on TikTok, you know, TikTok can, I mean, uh, AI can do it one particular way, but it becomes a very generic way of doing it. Whereas a student who might be living TikTok, you know, will come up with some really interesting ideas. So, you know, it's sort of a, a little bit of a dance I do with them to try to get them to use, the, use it. And I certainly don't discourage them to use, from using it at the same time. They've got to remain creative in their, in their thinking. And, you know, whether it's marketing or developing a script, it's sort of the same world, all the same idea. Yeah. I remember my time as a creative executive at Universal, I had, I had to read the screenplays before the films were made, then, you know, watch the film once they were made and see how maybe that script changed or whatever evolved, but fascinating process, but, you know, we as marketers had to know every line in that movie and, and determine, Hey, is this a line that could be in a trailer? Right. And is this a scene that should be in a trailer and, and that kind of intimate knowledge by reading it and then watching it has to mean something more than in putting in the entire screenplay, which I wouldn't do into chat CPT and say, Hey, create a campaign from this. It's like, you know, there's still this human dissection and understanding and synthesis of what, what is read and understood. And, you know, the, the human light bulb goes off and says, oh my God, th this is the way to position it, right? Because this is the hook, of, right? There's some type of, you know, catalyst for creativity, uh, a spark there that's uh, human based, based on your knowledge of the subject, right? And you can't rely on these tools now what i mean once you have that kind of initial insight you could you could guide it you could say hey create a campaign around this character who you know has a certain amount of scenes and a point of view and maybe build that out and create a some type of campaign whether it's a trailer or social media campaign but that's you know the human being at the center of that driving that and then it's just a tool uh so it, it seems like the prompt is very, very important and increasingly so. I mean, and you have to sort of drill down when you get these prompts and after you get the first version, so that's fine, but try this or maybe do this or do that. You have to be very polite, I've learned. I'm not polite. I hate to say please, please and thank you. I can't get mad at chat you because that's a shitty ass job you just did. It doesn't, it's not going to resonate. So, but it, yes, I agree with you. Um, that human spark of creativity will never, will never go away because you can't invent that. You know, you cannot, you can write a screenplay based on, you know, a parameter. You can come up with a, you know, a horror screenplay relatively easy, easily through chat GTP. But again, you know, what's that special unique thing, the same way as independent movies thrive, not because they are produced necessarily produced well or shot well. Well, they have a talent in it, but it's about what's the kernel of the idea that makes it unique that can actually, you know, intrigue an audience is you know, wanting to see it, you know, online or offline. And I don't think that's something that a, any kind of a program can really uh, replicate. Yeah. I mean, Hollywood in general, they are immersed in, you know, sequel, topia, Marvel, mania, you know, how I just don't see how that can be perpetuated. Certainly the budgets and some recent failures for the Marvel type of storytelling. They may have been great comic books, but I don't, I don't think Disney's done a great job of extending that library. And I think there's burnout, you know, coupled with 
less people going to the movies to see these big effects movies. But, you know, I think, I think the audience is becoming uh, nostalgic and wanting something else. What are your thoughts on, on, on that? Well, I don't know that adult dramas will ever make a big comeback in through the studio system, you know, the 25 to $35 million movie, which is basically a, a passion project with a director and the, you know, some talent. I think they will still be around. And those are the ones that might get nominated for, you know, into the awards cycle, but they're not big money makers. And I think that's always a problem, you know, with these studios, which are owned by, you know, these mega companies, they're, they're the pressure to produce, you know, a, a $500 million result on anything is, is extraordinary. So I say, let the studios play that game. You know, I think they will continue to do it. I think there's, there will always be some mining done. All right. So Marvel is now maybe run its course, but now maybe DC is going to come around or, you know, whatever the next universe will be. I think those aren't necessarily going away. And even now you notice Netflix is now creating a world of Bridgerton and they're, you know, doing spin-offs of all those yeah. so, you know, the same idea and everybody is taking what is, you know, what's an established IP or, you know, a piece of, a piece of content and basically expanding it. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And they all, but they all have a half-life. Yeah. You know, there's a point where you can exhaust it. I mean. I'm curious what's going to happen with the Penguin series now with Batman and all that. They might be on the similar thing. Penguin did better than you know, the, the new Joker movie, right? Which is the worst movie. Ooh. So it's sad. I think not only the worst, you know, comic book movie, but I think the worst movie of all time. It's unfortunate. Why? Wow, because the, the original Joker was really powerful. It's like amazing how the kids well, can look the 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 Yeah. They went back to the well. I mean, yes, they try to come up with a unique way of doing it through music, whatever. I haven't seen it yet, but I will. But again, going back to Venice, trying to premiere it again, you cannot do it a second time because everybody is so cynical about, well, why are you doing this again? Yeah. You already had this success, take it and run. You know, don't come back I... and try to do it again. And I think, you know, it just sort of, the, the, the snowball just sort of snowballed from there. People started to pile on it. I mean, regardless of how good the movie was or not, I mean, it, it might've been a misfire because of trying to mix, you know, the characters of those two, those two plus music and, you know, and Joaquin is, you know, he's such an interesting actor, but there is a point where, yeah, you know, you know, he's, he's a great actor. actor. I remember Clay Pigeons back in the day. I thought that was a great <laughs> film, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the. You know, as we get back to the AI discussion, we talked about screenwriting, uh, human centered or creative centered AI, and, and that, you know, creators could and should be in the driver's seat to steer this technology. It's a tool, not a replacement. There's a lot of disruption, certainly as the streaming wars are coming to an end. And you're right that every studio decided they had to be a streamer, which was a false pretense and, and not sustainable. So now you see a lot of consolidation bundling and I, you know, perhaps the Paramount deal will go through. I think there's some recent challenges on that with the, the sky dance happen. You know, I, I, I hope so. Cause I think David Ellison is very, you know, creative minded. Well, there's a, there's a friendly administration coming up, which I think will bless that rather, rather easily, particularly with, with dad, dad and Donald are, you know, probably pretty, pretty tight, I think so. Yeah. Toward <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see. But you know, does this kind of reshuffling of the deck of what studios are supposed to do, what streamers are supposed to do, it, it, is that a new opportunity for independent film? And and will AI help independent filmmakers level up their films with limited budgets? It certainly it certainly was, you know, when these streamers were you know, going through their expansion, not any different than what it was like during the, the DVD days when all these movies were being made that never saw a theatrical release and went right on to, you know, into Blockbuster. But now that doesn't exist anymore. Those movies don't exist anymore. And I think it's going to get harder in terms of where these movies can be placed. I mean, you know, I'm going to Sundance in, in a month and a half and 
there'll be 300 movies there with, you know, 150 directors and producers, you know, fawning over the few Asians that might be trying to buy this stuff with the companies. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it, it's not going away, but I think there's fewer and fewer deals right now. And I think a lot of the challenges for independent filmmaking is how do you do it yourself? Yeah. You know, after you're sort of 15 minutes and nobody buys your movie, you know, what do you do? Yeah. You know, and you got to satisfy your investors. I don't care whether you made your movie for $50,000 or 5 million. You know, there's still a, um, a necessity to pay back your, your investment is to try to amortize it, you know, try to make, make as much money as you can based on what you've got. So that's a big learning process for, for independent filmmakers and producers. And um, even the whole documentary world, which was very, very hot for a long time. Yeah. Netflix is buying them left and right and Hulu. They're still available, but again, it's not like it was a couple of years ago. So I think, and a lot of this, you know, it's some of it was strike driven. Some of it is based on consolidation. I think a lot of these smaller movies that were at one point place fillers, so to speak, mm -hmm. not to dent with them, there's no longer the need for that. You know, all these streamers are doing original programming. They don't necessarily need to acquire movies anymore. So it's, you know, it'll be a challenge, but I, I do think. This will turn, I keep telling my students that, you know, don't worry about getting a job in June, worry about it in August. And if it doesn't work then, it'll happen in September. There is a, it's going to turn. I think, I think it, there'll be a, a, a sort of an upswing, but it's going to take, it's going to take a couple of years before it happens again. Yeah. I think, I think we're still getting over the pandemic and retraining a new generation to go back to the movies, but. Essentially, you know, people do love movies, you know, it's undeniable, it's such a rich history and I think you're right in, in a couple of years, it's, you know, retraining the audience and it's let, let the dust settle from whatever mergers and acquisitions might happen, but there, there's certainly a desire. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, so it's, it's never going to go away. It's just the business of it is changing and that's forcing these studios to reconsider, you know, technology plays should be, should they be a streamer or not? Should they be global or all these things are forcing monetary pressures on the slate, right? How, how many films can a studio make? How many TV series can a studio make? And we haven't even talked about, you know, the death of cable, which has also been, you know, yeah. part of entertainment. So yeah, the same, have all these, all these streaming, but they're fast, you know, they're free advertising, supported television. Now they're all sort of going back to the cable model. It's just pretty great. Like, yeah, it's well, comes around, comes around. Okay, they, it's like, yeah. it's like, yeah, it's exhausting to think about, but, but, you know, I, I, I love and support certainly the filmmaking community, the film marketing community. And if people love movies, movies always need to be marketed and people need to be able to find them. You know, that's one criticism of Apple. They have some great series on there, but no one knows about them. It's not too many advertising. I know, it's interesting. Apple's very interesting. I mean, obviously they don't need it. Um, and they are very, very I mean, little. They're not, they're not the most popular streamer, but they oh, have money and the they, 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 you know, put money and, and get attract great stars, but... You know, there's just no awareness, right? I mean, you created campaigns. It's like you go wide, you go small, you go wide. You know, there's money, there's millions of dollars behind the, behind the campaign. So you can make a, you know, billion dollar movie. Uh, but there's just none of that marketing in with some of these streamers. Well, they lost $237 million on Killers of the Flower Moon. I ran the numbers in my class last week, which was pretty astonishing. And I do think that, you know, after that one and Napoleon and in Argyle, you know, they're all pulling back from these big budget movies. I think they, they realized, even Apple realizes that, you know, it's, it's not, you know, even Wolf's, which was there, Brad Pitt, right. George Clooney, movie, which was all destined to go theatrically, they decided the last minute, it's not worth spending a 55 million or $60 million in marketing costs. And it, it went online and, you know, it's done, it's done fine there. So I think. The big um, streaming two hundred million dollar plus movies going away. That's not going to happen anymore. Which is fine, you know. You don't. 
there's a reason that that movie wasn't decided, it wasn't picked up by anybody else. Not that it's a bad movie, but I mean, it, the, the economics were just sort of impossible. Right. And certainly from a traditional point of view, you know, it's the same way when you go to Sundance, you know, there's all these little companies like Searchlight and Focus are all, you know, battling each other at age 24, battling each other to pay $5 million to $6 million, you know, for a movie. And all of a sudden, Apple comes along or, and they say, oh, no, we'll pay, we'll pay 25 and goodbye. Yeah. And it's over. Yeah. You know? Right. And you can find the filmmakers were taking the money. Look, you know, Code is a perfect example. They spooked it up, you know, a couple of years ago and they ended up with the best picture. Yeah. Um, well, something on, on Killers of the Fire Moon, the, the book was better than the, than the movie. Yeah. I mean, yeah, these, these, these are very difficult projects. I mean, the, the talent is extraordinary and I'm sure there'll be more, but I think even Netflix is saying, well, well, I guess there was a recent deal with Wuthering Heights, which is Margot Robbie was directing it. I mean, we start producing it and maybe starring in it with Emerald Farrell, you know, who did Sulper, the director, very hot director. And I believe that Netflix offered them $150 million for the movie. Thank you very much. Yeah. And they said no. Mm-hmm. And they went to Warner Brothers, who promised them the full theatrical release, you know, with all the bells and whistles. And they paid him 80, $80 million for it. So who knows how much the movie actually cost to make? Right. It's going to spring. The seventy million dollar profit line, which they walked away from, but again, a lot of these filmmakers realize that, and I think the streamers do too, that the, the theatrical experience is still really, really important. The yeah. creating awareness and want to see, and, you know, it also is sort of set the, the, the scene for the long tail of these movies as they get licensed throughout their ten year lives, you know, on television, come back again, windowing, all that kind of stuff. So. Again, but the problem is with the independent, with the smaller movies, even though everybody acknowledges how important theatrical is, the means of that distribution are so expensive that it's sort of a push and pull as to what, you know, where do you draw the line? How much can you spend? I do think that sort of the limited theatrical release now that some of these movies are getting where they play two to three weeks at a theater, mm-hmm. you know, with a limited amount of money, but again, you get publicity, you get reviews, yeah. marketing, you know, the required stuff, and then... If you go into a streamer, you know, two weeks later or three weeks later, and all that attention has already been created theatrically, it it, it pays off, you know. No, it's it's, name, name recognition, star recognition, you know, there's yeah. value in that that they, they've seen elsewhere that drive them to their every night experience. Well, what's on Netflix tonight? The other, the other thing I want to ask about is, you know, I think Netflix is reconsidering their business model because... That quote unquote, there is no back end, <laughs> right? With Netflix, certainly, which has been the case, but but now they're reconsidering based on performance metrics, which have been a mystery of like how well does a movie do on, on Netflix? What what are you measuring? Subscriptions? It's like that's one thing, but when they say the most watched movie, like compared to what? You yeah. know, it's uh, you know, it's uh, Neil says out the window, right? Whatever the metrics were in the film industry, which you know very well, those are all shot to hell. And then Netflix has its own model of measuring success and how do you determine a back end deal, which don't well, exist at this point, but maybe part of the future moving forward. I, I think it will. But again, you know, it was a very, very uh, enticing idea when a company like Netflix comes to you and say, Okay, your budget is $10 million. We'll pay you 30% on top of that. You have 100% creative control. And, you know, we'll just take it when you deliver it. I mean, that's a very enticing proposition for a filmmaker, for an agent. Yeah. You know, you're worrying about the, the, the back end because you're getting it up front. And, you know, a lot of deals went down that way. And a lot of filmmakers said, sure, okay. Now, those, that kind of, you know, percentage above budget is changing. So if that's to so get lower, then of course, then how do you determine, you know, what they should be getting to replace that additional percentage they were getting, right? Therefore, the metrics are now starting to come back in. But again, it's really only the, you know, the super filmmakers and the super producers and showrunners, which is sort of getting those deals now. Yeah, um, the Spurs you know, used to be making, you know, multi-picture deals, right, right with Netflix and 
But, uh, you know, at the same time, they're, they're not, they might be getting it back in, but the budgets might not necessarily be through the roof anymore. You know. So. Well, it's a good shit about time. So any pearls of wisdom on AI in film? And I, I just wanted to shout out, you know, thank you for participating in our El Ceylon. It was a big success and your, your content has been amplified on social, by the way. Uh, so thanks for doing that and supporting that effort. And you, you do have an important voice based on your career and knowledge and your position, which certainly within the education community now. So thank you for all that you do, but any, any last pearls, uh, pearls of wisdom to young filmmakers, young marketers. Industry executives of where this is all going and, and how I, how well, I could help or hinder. It's, it's not any different than the way it's always been that you've got to be tenacious. You've got to love rejection. There's a, there's a saying that Billy Jean King used to say when, with the tour tennis players, pressure is a privilege and, you know, this certainly exists in the film business. And I think, you know, it's just about being tenacious about it and not giving up and you will be, you know, you'll, you'll. You'll have a worse batting average than any baseball player, much better, much less than 30%. You'll get a hit. But again, it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're doing anything wrong. You're just evolving in your career. And at some point it catches, you know, it, it always catches, but you have to stay with really, really important. And it's very frustrating. I know. Yeah. Persevere. And, uh, I, I love the notion of, of, of embracing rejection as part of the process. Yeah, because, yeah that, that, that is. So listen, thanks, Russell, so much. Thank you for tuning in, all of you who are listening or watching. And catch more of our Realm IQ sessions on your favorite podcast platforms like Apple uh, Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music. And please follow and smash that subscribe button. That's really important. And or download these podcasts. That's really important for our measurement and our metrics. So thanks again, Russell. I hope to have you. Out again, and good luck to you with your with Sundance. Have fun at Sundance. That's always fun. All right, gonna move away in right my Salt Lake City though, or Park City. Well, my hunch is it's gonna stay in Salt Lake, and it'll become a Salt Lake Festival because it's a much more it's a much more functional city, and and Park City will still be there, but for the events, yeah. you know, and the special art stuff. I have a feeling it's not going anywhere. Anywhere, city Santa Fe lost out on it. Oh well. Uh, that would have been nice to the uh, Southwest image in your background there. Yeah, exactly. Mind um, you, nice to have you. Really appreciate it. A lot of fun to talk. Thank you. Take care. Realm IQ. Book your corporate AI workshop today. Subscribe to our Media Slam newsletter and learn more about the intersection of design, content, and technology. KurtDody.co Branding, Marketing, and Product Development.